Book Two, Chapters Thirteen and Fourteen of the Antipodes of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Two, Chapters Thirteen and Fourteen. Chapter Thirteen. How Moses and Aaron returned into Egypt to Pharaoh. So Moses, when he understood that the Pharaoh, in whose reign he fled away, was dead, asked leave of Ragel to go into Egypt, for the benefit of his own people. And he took with him Zipporah, the daughter of Ragel, whom he had married, and the children he had by her, Gersom and Eleazar, and made haste into Egypt. Now the former of those names, Gersom, in the Hebrew tongue, signifies that he was in a strange land, and Eleazar, that, by the assistance of the god of his fathers, he had escaped from the Egyptians. Now when they were near the borders, Aaron his brother, by the command of God, met him, to whom he declared what had befallen him at the mountain, and the commands that God had given him. But as they were going forward, the chief men among the Hebrews, having learned that they were coming, met them, to whom Moses declared the signs he had seen. And while they could not believe them, he made them see them. So they took courage at these surprising and unexpected sights, and hoped well of their entire deliverance, as believing now that God took care of their preservation. Since then Moses found that the Hebrews would be obedient to whatsoever he should direct, as they promised to be, and were in love with liberty, he came to the king who had indeed but lately received the government, and told him how much he had done for the good of the Egyptians when they were despised by the Ethiopians, and their country laid waste by them, and how he had been the commander of their forces and had labored for them as if they had been his own people, and he informed him in what danger he had been during that expedition without having any proper returns made him as he had deserved. He also informed him distinctly what things happened to him at Mount Sinai, and what God said to him, and the signs that were done by God, in order to assure him of the authority of those commands which he had given him. He also exhorted him not to disbelieve what he told him, nor to oppose the will of God. But when the king derided Moses, he made him in earnest see the signs that were done at Mount Sinai yet was the king very angry with him, and called him an ill man, who had formerly run away from his Egyptian slavery, and came now back with deceitful tricks and wonders, and magical arts to astonish him. And when he had said this, he commanded the priests to let him see the same wonderful sights, as knowing that the Egyptians were skillful in this kind of learning, and that he was not the only person who knew them, and pretended them to be divine as also he told him, that when he brought such wonderful sights before him, he would only be believed by the unlearned. Now when the priests threw down their rods, they became serpents. But Moses was not daunted at it, and said, O king, I do not myself despise the wisdom of the Egyptians, but I say that what I do is so much superior to what these do by magic arts and tricks, as divine power exceeds the power of man but I will demonstrate that what I do is not done by craft, or counterfeiting what is not really true, but that they appear by the providence and power of God. And when he had said this, he cast his rod down upon the ground, and commanded it to turn itself into a serpent. It obeyed him, and went all round, and devoured the rods of the Egyptians, which seemed to be dragons, until it had consumed them all. It then returned to its own form, and Moses took it into his hand again. However, the king was no more moved when he was done than before, and being very angry, he said he should gain nothing by this his cunning and shrewdness against the Egyptians, and he commanded him that was the chief taskmaster over the Hebrews to give them no relaxation from their labors, but to compel them to submit to greater oppressions than before and though he allowed them chaff before for making their bricks, he would allow it them no longer. But he made them to work hard at brick-making in the daytime, and to gather chaff in the night. Now when their labor was thus doubled upon them, they laid the blame upon Moses, 
because their labor and their misery were on his account become more severe to them. But Moses did not let his courage sink for the king's threatenings, nor did he abate of his zeal on account of the Hebrews' complaints, but he supported himself and set his soul resolutely against them both, and used his own utmost diligence to procure liberty to his countrymen. So he went to the king and persuaded him to let the Hebrews go to Mount Sinai, and there to sacrifice to God, because God had enjoined them so to do. He persuaded him also not to counterwork the designs of God, but to esteem his favor above all things, and to permit them to depart, lest, before he be aware, he lay an obstruction in the way of the divine commands, and so occasion his own suffering such punishments as it was probable any one that counterworked the divine commands should undergo, since the severest afflictions arise from every object to those that provoke the divine wrath against them. For such as these have neither the earth nor the air for their friends, nor the fruits of the womb according to nature, but everything is unfriendly or adverse towards them. He said further, that the Egyptians should know this by sad experience, and that besides, the Hebrew people should go out of their country without their consent. Chapter 14. Concerning the Ten Plagues Which Came Upon the Egyptians But when the king despised the words of Moses, and had no regard at all to them, grievous plagues seized the Egyptians, every one of which I will describe, both because no such plagues did ever happen to any other nation as the Egyptians now felt, and because I would demonstrate that Moses did not fail in any one thing that he foretold them, and because it is for the good of mankind that they may learn this caution, not to do anything that may displease God, lest he be provoked to wrath and avenge their iniquities upon them. For the Egyptian river ran with bloody water at the command of God, insomuch that it could not be drunk, and they had no other spring of water neither, for the water was not only of the color of blood, but it brought upon those that ventured to drink of it great pains and bitter torment. Such was the river to the Egyptians, but it was sweet and fit for drinking to the Hebrews, and no way different from what it naturally used to be. As the king therefore knew not what to do in these surprising circumstances, and was in fear for the Egyptians, he gave the Hebrews leave to go away. But when the plague ceased, he changed his mind again, and would not suffer them to go. But when God saw that he was ungrateful, and upon the ceasing of this calamity would not grow wiser, he sent another plague upon the Egyptians. An innumerable multitude of frogs consumed the fruit of the ground. The river was also full of them, insomuch that those who drew water had it spoiled by the blood of these animals, as they died in and were destroyed by the water. And the country was full of filthy slime, as they were born and as they died. They also spoiled their vessels in their houses which they used, and were found among what they eat and what they drank, and came in great numbers upon their beds. There was also an ungrateful smell, and a stink arose from them as they were born, and as they died therein. Now, when the Egyptians were under the oppression of these miseries, the king ordered Moses to take the Hebrews from them and be gone, upon which the whole multitude of the frogs vanished away, and both the land and the river returned to their former natures. But as soon as Pharaoh saw the land freed from this plague, he forgot the cause of it, and retained the Hebrews, and, as though he had a mind to try the nature of more such judgments, he would not yet suffer Moses and his people to depart, having granted that liberty rather out of fear than out of any good consideration. Accordingly, God punished his falseness with another plague added to the former, for there arose out of the bodies of the Egyptians an innumerable quantity of lice, by which, wicked as they were, they miserably perished, as not able to destroy this sort of vermin, either with washes or with ointments at which terrible judgment the king of Egypt was in disorder, upon the fear into which he reasoned himself, lest his people should be destroyed, and that the manner of this death was also reproachful, so that he was forced in part to recover himself from his wicked temper to a sounder mind, for he gave leave for the Hebrews themselves to depart. But when the plague thereupon ceased, 
he thought it proper to require that they should leave their children and wives behind them as pledges of their return, whereby he provoked God to be more vehemently angry at him, as if he thought to impose on his providence, and as if it were only Moses and not God who punished the Egyptians for the sake of the Hebrews. For he filled that country full of various sorts of pestilential creatures, with their various properties, such indeed as had never come into the sight of men before, by whose means the men perished themselves, and the land was destitute of husbandmen for its cultivation. But if anything escaped destruction from them, it was killed by a distemper which the men underwent also. But when Pharaoh did not even then yield to the will of God, but, while he gave leave to the husbands to take their wives with them, yet insisted that the children should be left behind, God presently resolved to punish his wickedness with several sorts of calamities, and those worse than the foregoing, which yet had so generally afflicted them, for their bodies had terrible boils breaking forth with flames, while they were already inwardly consumed, and a great part of the Egyptians perished in this manner. But when the king was not brought to reason by this plague, hail was sent down from heaven, and such hail it was, as the climate of Egypt had never suffered before, nor was it like to that which falls in other climates in winter time, but was larger than that which falls in the middle of spring to those that dwell in the northern and northwestern regions. This hail broke down their boughs laden with fruit. After this, a tribe of locusts consumed the seed which was not hurt by the hail, so that to the Egyptians all hopes of the future fruits of the ground were entirely lost. One would think the forementioned calamities might have been sufficient for one that was only foolish, without wickedness, to make him wise, and to make him sensible what was for his advantage. But Pharaoh, led not so much by his folly as by his wickedness, even when he saw the cause of his miseries, he still contested with God, and willfully deserted the cause of virtue. So he bid Moses take the Hebrews away, with their wives and children, to leave their cattle behind, since their own cattle were destroyed. But when Moses said what he desired was unjust, since they were obliged to offer sacrifices to God of those cattle, and the time being prolonged on this account, a thick darkness, without the least light, spread itself over the Egyptians, whereby their sight being obstructed, and their breathing hindered by the thickness of the air, they died miserably, and under a terror, lest they should be swallowed up by the dark cloud. Besides this, when the darkness, after three days and as many nights, was dissipated, and when Pharaoh did not still repent and let the Hebrews go, Moses came to him and said, How long wilt thou be disobedient to the command of God? For he enjoins thee to let the Hebrews go, nor is there any other way of being freed from the calamities are under, unless you do so. But the king was angry at what he said, and threatened to cut off his head if he came any more to trouble him these matters. Hereupon Moses said he not speak to him any more about them, for he himself, together with the principal men among the Egyptians, should desire the Hebrews away. But when God had signified that with one plague he would compel the Egyptians to let the Hebrews go, he commanded Moses to tell the people that they should have a sacrifice ready, and should prepare themselves on the tenth day of the month Xanthicus, against the fourteenth, which month is called by the Egyptians Farmuth, Nisan by the Hebrews, but the Macedonians call it Xanthicus, and that he should carry the Hebrews with all they had. Accordingly, he having got the Hebrews ready for their departure, and having sorted the people into tribes, he kept them together in one place. But when the fourteenth day was come, and all were ready to depart, they offered the sacrifice, and purified their houses with the blood, using branches of hyssop for that purpose. And when they had supped, they burnt the remainder of the flesh, as just ready to depart. Whence it is that we do still offer this sacrifice in like manner to this day, and call this festival Pasha, which signifies the feast of the Passover, because on that day God passed us over, and sent the plague upon the Egyptians for the destruction of the firstborn came upon the Egyptians that night, so that many of the Egyptians who lived near the king's palace persuaded Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go. 
Accordingly he called for Moses and bid them be gone, as supposing that if once the Hebrews were gone out of the country, Egypt should be freed from its miseries. They also honored the Hebrews with gifts, some in order to get them to depart quickly, and others on account of their neighborhood and the friendship they had with them. End of Book 2, Chapters 13 and 14